in this. I, yeah, so today I, I'm just going to, we're just going to jump in. I'm going to lay some groundwork. We're going to be, we're going to be looking at plenty of scripture though. Don't worry. Um, but as I said at the start today, we're going to be considering the gospel and, you know, so obviously humans are quite complicated people and the world is made up of many different cultures and, and people groups and nations and histories and the gospel works in all of these contexts and applies to all of these contexts. And we're a very international church. I mean, just look around you guys. Like, we have people from all over the world here. Um, and human cultures can be, and I want to emphasize very broadly, be divided into three categories. Um, and so as we talk through that, I, I want to talk through those because we have people from all three of those categories um, with us today. Um, and so I want to talk through how the gospel meets and, and, and works in each of those contexts. And I actually hope that we'll all see, I, I hope that we're going to get a, a, a more complete, a broader, a deeper view of the gospel. Because there are things that we in the U.S. emphasize that someone from the Middle East, a Christian from the Middle East, wouldn't emphasize. And the thing is, is that God actually, like humans need both of these things, and God meets both of those needs. Um, and so that's, that's my aim today. Um, and I'm going to be talking very broadly, very generally. You will probably be able to think of exceptions. I can as well. Like, I, this isn't meant to be a, like a sociology lecture or anything. So we're, I'm going to be talking very broadly. So just bear with me in that. Um, but before we jump in and before we start, well... Before we jump into the scripture, I think it would be better if we start with defining some terms, because I think that will make the passages we're going to read a little more clear. So as I said, human, human cultures can, again, very broadly be divided into three categories in terms of their response to the gospel. You have what are known as guilt-innocence cultures. You have what's known as shame-honor cultures. And you have what's known as fear-power cultures. And now I want to say that the vast majority of cultures tend to emphasize one of these. They have a pretty strong undercurrent of a second. And then the third one, you just kind of see here or there. But you can actually find elements of all three of these in every human culture. But we generally tend to emphasize one of these. There's usually a, a strong undercurrent of a second one. Uh, and then the third one, you just you find bits and pieces of it. I forgot to start my timer. Um, the Bible is written in a shame-honor context, with a very strong undercurrent of fear and power, and with some guilt innocence, um, just for context there. So what I want us to do, we're going we're gonna to be in Ephesians, because Paul actually shows in just a few verses all three of these needs and all three of these responses to the gospel. Um, and so if you want to look with me at Ephesians 1, verse 5, it says, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And then look with me at verse 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. And then if you turn the page and look at chapter 3, verse 16 says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And also chapter 3, verse 20 it says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And, and I want to just make clear, I realize I, I maybe didn't make this quite clear before we read. So in a guilt-innocence culture, the primary thing that we at least feel that we need uh, freedom from is our guilt. Something, something needs to happen with our guilt. In a shame or an honor culture, it's shame you're trying to avoid and honor you're trying to get. And in a fear power culture, it's fear you're trying to deal with and power you're trying to, usually a spiritual form of power that you're trying to hold on to. And that's the thing is, is and, and we'll see this, we're actually going to consider um, Genesis, uh, chapter 3, Adam and Eve's response to their sin. You, we will, we'll, we'll consider that in a little bit. And we're going to see how they exhibit all three. They exhibit the guilt, the shame, and the fear. And God, in some way, meets them where they are right there, but then also promises Jesus, who is the ultimate fulfillment, who does declare us innocent, who does restore our honor, 
and who does give us power. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. So I wanted to start with just kind of walking through what each, each one of these terms kind of means and what they look like. Again, these are broad strokes. Um, and then also we'll consider some of the, the passages of scripture that we tend to go to or people in these cultures tend to go to. So we'll start with guilt innocence because that's the one I'm most familiar with. So um, guilt innocence cultures are primarily Western contexts. These, uh, the United States, Canada, Australia, most of Western Europe. Um, these tend towards individuality. The individual is the one that matters. Uh, relationship with God is very personal and very just, it's me and God. And others have little to no input in that. Uh, very strong senses of right and wrong that individuals supposedly adhere to. And individuals are kind of expected, they're expected to do what's right for the sake of it being right, for these, these internalized codes of conduct that we have, that we've made. Like we, we tell our kids, don't do that because it's wrong. You know, you need to share. You need to not take that. You need to, and, and they're made to feel guilty if they don't do that. And that, and, and if, but if there is a breach of that, of that code of conduct, if someone does wrong, then they're expected to make up for it in some way. But if I do something wrong, it doesn't necessarily reflect on my wife. It could if I did something really bad, but, but most people would say, well, no, Elliot did that, not Hilder, you know, or if your child does something wrong, usually they're the ones that need to either apologize or make up for it. Um, you know, if I break Christian's window, I'm expected to pay for it. And that, that's how it goes. Um, that I've, I've made reparations, you know, I've either apologized and, and given him something, or maybe I'll justify myself and say, well, you know, I needed to break the window because I don't know, I needed to get out or something. I didn't think that image through very well, but, um, and so in guilt, innocence cultures, when there's, when, when sin is committed or we don't always think of it as sin, but when, when we do something wrong, the, the way to make it right, the way to make up for it is to either apologize and just, you know, okay, I said the right things. I'm, I'm appropriately saddened over what I've done. So the person's okay, or to justify it in some way. And then of course you even have like on a, on a social level across like these Western contexts, if I steal, for example, I might go to jail, and that's considered my reparation. That's considered the way I atone for and make up for what I've done wrong. And you'll see that we, you know, and I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this because you're, both your pastors are from the West. So we use the metaphor um, of a courtroom with God as a judge and Jesus as advocate. That language is pervasive in a lot of Western-produced literature and how we think through the gospel. And I want to make something very clear here. Um, in all three of these contexts, I'm not saying that these are wrong ways. All I'm trying to do is help us see how different people groups conceptualize and understand what God has done. And I'm hoping that as we gain a broader understanding of that, it will actually help us comprehend more deeply and actually love God more deeply um, it just for what God has done. Um, and so, for example, turn with me to Colossians, uh, just a few pages over. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a passage that I'm sure you're all going to be quite familiar with. If you look with me in Colossians 2, verse 14. Well, actually, look with me at the second part of verse 13, because that, that provides some important context. And we saw that last week, context is very important. God made alive together with him, him being Jesus Christ, having forgiven us, Again, there's that word, forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And that's, oh, sorry. I, sorry. <laughs> and that's a, that's a verse that we, that we go to quite a bit. This really sums up that we, we very much think of ourselves, okay, yeah, we've sinned. We're in a debt before God. We've done something wrong. We need to Either we need to justify this or we need to atone for it. We need to, we need to, something needs to happen here. We need to pay for this in some way. And the gospel is, or at least one main pillar of the gospel is that you can't atone for it. It's that you can't make up for it. And that's what Jesus does. He pays our debt of sin. Amen? 
And so that, and that, and we see, we see this line of thinking, um, you know, this was prevalent in the Reformation. Um, the reformers were hammering very hard on the, um, just on the justice of God, on the holiness of God, and just the, the rightness of God and the wrongness of the sinner. And so that, that's really influenced a lot of Western thought um, of how we conceptualize the gospel and how we think through our relationship with God. And so that's one pillar. Now, if we consider shame, honor, and this is primarily in like the Middle East, um, also in Eastern Asia. Um, and fun fact, these play out very differently <laughs> depending on where you are. Um, we're not going to go into that right now because that will sidetrack us to no end. But I recommend you read about it. And so in a shame, in a shame honor context, usually society is a, mu- a much more communal. It's a, it's, it's a much more communal unit. So interpersonal relationships are a lot more they're, they're valued a lot more highly than maybe in an individualistic context. Um, it matters who you know. It matters who you are. Um, the, your actions don't just reflect on you, but they reflect on the people that you know and are tied to. And I, you've probably already seen how this would apply to our relationship with God. Um, yeah, an individual's actions will have a ripple effect, and that will either bring shame on your family, your tribe, your people, or it will bring honor. And interpersonal, interpersonal relationships, these are critical. The whole society is built on this. Like, you know, in the United States, for example, I would just go to a government office if I needed something. Whereas in Africa, um, you know, I, when, let me start that over. <laughs> I grew up in the country of Mauritania and my parents had to learn, my parents were like 35 when we moved, and they had to learn that going to the government offices was almost, it basically wasn't worth it. It was an absolute waste of time. They needed to have the connections to get anything done. So it matters who you know. Hospitality and gift giving, um, these are really important hallmarks of a shame honor, of a communal society. Um, these are reciprocated uh, because if you don't, then you, you bring shame upon yourself. You're seen as taking advantage of someone else's hospitality, of the, the resources, the effort, the energy that they are expending to bring honor to you, you're simply taking advantage of that. Um, we see a lot of just authoritarian power structures. Um, individuality is not generally viewed positively. Like I said, I'm talking very broadly. This is actually starting to change with globalization, with the internet and all that. Um, but so morality in a communal society like this, morality is defined much more in terms of what is right and wrong relationally, not necessarily what's internal. And so to forgive someone, it's more than just pardoning someone. It's more than Christian just saying, oh yeah, don't worry about it, man, for his window. It's actually a relational restoration. It's actually a, okay, no, this, you in some way have offended or shamed me and I'm I'm like covering that up. I'm letting it go. I'm restoring that relationship. And so just like in a guilt innocence culture, we're prone to justify what we've done. We're prone to say, well, you know, it wasn't, I, you know, the devil made me do it, whatever. Like we're, tr- we're prone to just to justify a more common response in a shame honor context is to hide, is to cover it up. Because if nobody knows, if it doesn't, then it doesn't affect the relationship. And remember, what's done, uh, what, what's, what's defined as right and wrong has to do with how it affects the relationship. And so the need here is, and, that, and that's why we read, you know, in Ephesians, um, in verse 5, it says that God predestined us for adoption as sons. Because to not be part of a family or a tribe is shameful. To not be part of that or to be cut off from that brings shame upon an individual. And so God, part of the gospel is that God restores that honor. He takes away that shame and he brings us into his family, adopting us as daughters and sons. And turn with me to Psalm 44, because I think this will provide us a good, I think it provides a good picture of kind of what, what we're talking about here. starting in verse 9, Psalm 44. It says, but you, uh, this is a psalmist crying out to God, it says, you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe and those who hate us have gotten spoil. 
You have made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us the taunt of our neighbors, a derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughingstock among the peoples. All day long, my grace is before me and shame has covered my face. At the sound of the taunter and reviler, at the sight of the enemy and the avenger. When a, so when God gives Israel the Mosaic covenant on Mount Sinai, when he makes a covenant between them, like you're going to be my people, I'm going to be your God. And he gives them this whole sacrificial system. He gives them, you know, just how they're going to live and how they're going to be distinct from the people. He also promises blessings and curses depending on their obedience or lack thereof to the covenant. And if they're faithful, if they're obedient to the covenant, then God promises a lot of blessings for them. He promises to protect them, to uh, make their crops flourish and prosper. But if they're unfaithful to the covenant, if they break it, if they bring shame upon God on some way, then they are going to be dispersed. They're going to be exiled. And the exile was a great, a shameful event for Israel. And, and you see, we see that as, you re, as we read later. You know, we're, and we're going to jump into Nehemiah next week. And right off the bat, when Nehemiah is visited by some of his brothers, right off the bat, they're like, he's like, hey, how, how, how's Jerusalem? How are the people there? They're like, we're ashamed. And that's like right off the bat, like we don't, God isn't with us. We don't have power anymore. We've, we've violated our covenant and we're ashamed. And God has rightly punished us and shamed us. And what they need is a restoration. And by the time Jesus comes along, you know, he, we see, and, and I mean, this is, this is true throughout the Old Testament, but by the time Jesus comes along, Judaism has very much become purely ritualistic. It's, and the rituals are a way for Israel to kind of hide their shame, to cover up the fact that they aren't doing justice, that they aren't loving and treating the poor well, that they aren't actually doing what God's called them to do, but they're still sacrificing. They're still sometimes keeping their feasts. So as long as they do the outward thing, everything's fine, right? No, it's not. And that's the thing is God is, as we saw last week, God has always been more concerned with relationship over ritual. But ritual is a way to hide the shame. And so again, and that's, that's what Jesus comes, he fulfills that Old Testament covenant. He doesn't end it, like he doesn't like, do away with it. Rather, he fulfills it and inaugurates in a new covenant. And he restores that honor. He takes away that shame. And now we can have a right relationship with God. And lastly, you have, um, you have fear power um, contexts. And these are primarily found in, in both Africa and, and South America. And again, in these places, you have a formal religion, be it Christianity or Islam or something else. But the functional religion, what people actually practice, is animism. Is the, I mean, essentially, you're, uh, what you're trying to do is do the right rituals, the right things um, to keep certain spirits away, to keep evil spirits away, to keep bad influences out of your life. Um, and there's, a, there's a, just a very clear form of syncretism happening there. And I want to be clear, syncretism happens all over the world. We do it in the United States. We do it here. And we do it in Africa and South America as well. And I want to actually use Mauritania again as an example because Mauritania is known as the Islamic Republic of Mauritania. And the, the, the formal religion is Islam. And yet every kid I went to school with, every Mauritanian child that I went to school with had parts of the Quran wrapped around their like, wrists or their waist or their ankles as a way of warding off evil spirits. As, and, and this is actually something that's expressly forbidden in the Quran. Islam expressly forbids this. But the functional religion is, well, there are still evil spirits out there, so I'm going to do what I can to hold that at bay. Next to me, next to our house growing up, was actually a witch doctor. And he threw some wild parties, let me tell you. It was really loud sometimes. I don't know what was going on. But... Um, but yeah, everyone would just come, like all these cars would just be outside the house and people were in there trying to get favor of some sort and trying to, trying to get some sort of influence over what they perceived were evil spirits trying to ruin their life, maybe bring them bad luck, 
caused miscarriages, whatever it was. And so in these contexts, the spirit world, world is real and it has power and influence over human life. And this is something that we really don't consider in the West. We're people of science and knowledge. We don't consider, we don't consider this valid. But for most of the world, it is still considered both very real and very valid. And I think if you read in scripture, you would, we would also see that actually, yes, there is a real spirit world. I don't see why we would be warned against evil spirits if they weren't real. And so individuals in these contexts who have spiritual power are held in high regard. And actually, this is something, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of African brothers and sisters here. And to Gunan and I, it's quite weird sometimes how they talk to us. We don't know what to do with it because we're not used to it. But people who are, people who are viewed like be they in churches or like as witch doctors or whatever, those people are viewed, uh, they're respected. And that's something that just, we just, we're used to people looking at us with distrust. People are like, oh, you're a pastor. You take advantage of people. That's, that's the connotation we have. And it's so it's just worlds apart. It's completely different. And so it's always weird. Gunnar and I are both like, I mean, we really like it. Don't get us wrong. But it's just, it's weird for us how that, like, because it's just not our culture. And consider again Psalm 44, um, actually the end of the verse. The psalmist, um, still crying out to the Lord, says, Awake, this is verse 23 of Psalm 44. He says, Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself, do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust, and our belly clings to the ground. Rise up, come to our help, redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. And that's the thing is, is Jesus also shows his power over the spirit world. One of my favorite passages to consider um, is actually in Exodus. So if you'll turn with me to Exodus 12. I really, I just, this is such a mic drop on the part of God. It's awesome. No, seriously, like read, read through this and just, uh, yeah, read through the, the 10 plagues and the plagues were horrible, but it shows God's power very clearly over the gods of Egypt. And so if you look with me in, in Exodus 12, verse 12, this is when God is saying, is explaining what he's going to do for the 10th and final plague over Egypt. And if you look at the second part of verse 12, he says, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And the thing is, is these 10 plagues, the Egyptians worshipped these various elements, be they the Nile or frogs or whatever it was. Like God was specifically knocking down and demonstrating his power over the things that this culture and society put, like, put their trust in. We see God do this later with the Philistines when they capture the Ark of the Covenant and they put it before their god Dagon and they come in the next morning and their idol is face down before the altar or before the Ark of the Covenant. And so, you know, they set it back up and they say, okay, okay. The wind came in or something. We don't know what happened. But the next morning they walk in and not only is the altar or is the idol face down again, but its arms are broken off and its head is broken off. And that was an old symbol um, of how kings, what kings would do to conquered kings to show their dominance over them. And that's God saying, no, I am, actually, I am the Lord and I will execute judgments on these false gods. And so that's, that's the power. That's, that's the gospel response to fear power context is that God is actually more powerful than these evil spirits. And so now, well, since we're in Exodus, this, we don't have to go that far over. Um, turn back to Genesis chapter 3. This is the fall. This is when Adam and Eve sinned. And let's see. Um, Verse 6 in chapter 3, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delight, a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. There's a shame. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. 
trying to cover it. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves, fear, hiding themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, blame shifting, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then we know God curses each one. And we see in all three of these, we see shame, fear, and guilt in their response. Once their eyes are opened, they suddenly have three very pressing needs that only God can, can meet them in and only God can fix. And again, that's shame, that's fear, and that's guilt. And they try all three solutions. You know, they cover themselves up, they hide. You know, they're, they're fearful. They, you know, and they blame shift. They try to justify themselves, literally with, well, the devil made me do it. Or in Adam's case, the woman you gave me, God, again, trying to blame, will blame anyone except himself, even God himself. And God answers all three of these concerns. First and foremost, when he says to the serpent, Verse 15 of chapter 3, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And this, you don't need to remember this word, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. This is what's known as the Proto-Evangelium. And that just means the first gospel. Um, this is the first promise of Jesus. Now, of course, from that verse alone, there's very little information given. All we're told is that there will be, an, there will be the seed of the woman who crushes the head of the serpent. But this is the first time that God promises a Messiah, someone, a Savior, someone who is actually going to rightly and perfectly meet all three of these needs. And God comes looking for them. That's, the other, that's another very important part of the gospel here. It's, it's God who comes looking for them. The man and the woman hide themselves. But God, he's like, where are these guys? I'm going to go, I'm gonna go find them. And he calls to them. And we see at the end, um, at the end of the chapter, um, yes, verse 21 of chapter 3, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And so we see that he covers them. He, he covers um, that shame. He, an animal is, of course, killed. Um, and many, many read that as the first, the first sacrifice that is pointing towards the ultimate sacrifice, this Jesus. And so we see even right there, right in the midst of the very first sin, God's already there answering, providing a way forward. And so to kind of wrap this up, I just want to go through kind of how the gospel responds to each of, each of these concerns. And a point I want to make as well, I want to, I want to make the point that we, we need all three of these responses, even if we don't come from a culture that yeah. em, like, emphasizes it very much. We need the power of God. We need the honor of God. And we need the innocence that God gives us through Jesus. And so, first and foremost, and when I say first and foremost, this is just the order I'm going in. Jesus makes us innocent. He pays our debt. He is the perfect substitute because we are, in fact, guilty of breaking the law of God. We've all acted contrary to God's will. And th there's nothing we can do to justify ourselves. We cannot blame shift. We're all responsible for our own actions. We're truly guilty. And Jesus actually takes all that guilt on himself on the cross. Look with me at 1 John, all the way on the other end of your Bible. 1 John, chapter 2. 1 John, chapter 2, starting in verse... Starting in verse 1, at the second part of verse 1, he says, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And if you flip back a few pages to Hebrews 2, 
Starting in verse 10, it says, For it is fitting that he, that's, this is Jesus, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Um, and then if you skip down to verse 14, it says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And so we see, well, we see a couple things in there, but for our purposes here, we see that Jesus is the perfect substitute and that he had to be like us. He had to be a like representative of the human race, but he also had to be perfect so that he could be the propitiation, so that he could be the substitute um, in our place. And so Jesus is our advocate Jesus acknowledges our guilt. Like Jesus doesn't say, oh, no, 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 you didn't, you didn't do anything wrong. Jesus, no, you did, you did things wrong. But I paid for that. I shed my blood for that. My body was broken for that. And that's why we take communion every week. And next, the gospel restores our honor. Because whether or not we understand it, we, uh, we are both shamed by our sin, and we have brought shame upon God in violating his commandments and in violating his covenant. And so Jesus brings us into God's family. We're forgiven by God and we're adopted into the heavenly family. You know, and, and, and in thinking through how we've shamed God, um, if you consider Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9, and I know we have a lot of Daniels in here, so they were probably just going, wait a minute. But if you consider Daniel 9, when, when Daniel's praying, this is a great prayer, by the way. But he starts with, this is verse 4 of Daniel chapter 9. He says, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. Our relationship with God is severed by sin, and there's nothing that we can do to restore that. We need God, to whom belongs righteousness, to whom belongs all the honor and the glory, to restore that relationship. And that's the thing is, is there's no input from us in that. Consider Luke 15. I know I'm making you guys jump all over the place, but look at, look at Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son. Starting in verse 20, I'm... You know, I'm assuming that we've read this parable before, but when the, the prodigal son, you know, he takes his father's inheritance, he goes and he squanders it, and finally in shame, he comes back. And verse 20 of Luke 15, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, in this culture and in this context, with the amount of wealth, with the amount of status his father has, for him to run does not happen. For him to run is, is, is an, an, out, an outburst of both emotion and just it's something that actually makes him look silly. And in, in a culture where social capital matter, matters, looking silly isn't good, but he doesn't care. Jesus includes this detail in the parable, I think for a reason. And that God runs, God, well, the, father, the father who represents God in this runs towards the prodigal son who is us in this. And he embraces him, he kisses him, he feels compassion for him. He, you know, puts a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, brings the best robe, kills the fattened calf. And that's the thing is the son, when, as he was coming back, he, his plan was to just hopefully be taken back as a slave. There was nothing he could do to come back as a son. The father had to restore that to him. The father had to bring him back as a son and take him back as a son. And so the gospel restores our honor. Jesus restores our honor. And he even pointed to how he would do that during his time on earth as he heals paralytics, blind people, the woman um, with the discharge of blood. All of these were unclean and considered to be outside the community. But Jesus restores their honor by healing them. 
And lastly, the gospel liberates us. Jesus conquered Satan, sin, and death. We need a liberator because left to our own devices, on our own, you and I, we are trapped in our sin. The Bible describes Satan as the god of this world. We were in the kingdom of darkness, unable to do anything about that. We need a liberator. And Jesus conquered all of those elements. And he transfers us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And look back with me at at Colossians. Because I think that also shows us. So again, Colossians 2. And we looked at verse 14 already, but then look at verse 15. He, Jesus, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And the Holy Spirit now lives in us. The same Spirit, as Paul says in Romans 6, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. So we don't need to, we don't, like rituals don't save us. We don't need to try and go and acquire spiritual power somehow. We've already been sealed with the Holy Spirit. The same God who executed judgment against the gods of Egypt now lives in us. And so I know we've gone kind of all over the place today. I'm sorry if I, I tried to set this up in a way that it would hopefully be easy to follow, but um, if you want to talk, if you want to tell me something I missed, I'd be happy to come and talk with you. Um, yeah, this is something I really enjoy just thinking about and just different cultures and how the gospel like works and fits through each of these cultures um, and how it just, uh, yeah, how it meets the needs of that culture. And as far as Iceland goes, I've found that Iceland toes the line between guilt, innocence, and honor, shame in various ways. That's my experience. I've been here less than five years though. So i um, very willing to be wrong on that. Um, that's just been my experience. But brothers and sisters, we need all three elements of the gospel here. We need to be declared innocent. We need to be justified by Jesus. We need to be brought into God's family by Jesus, and we need to be liberated by Jesus. And so I hope that just as we, as we go forth from here, I'm hoping that this, you know, as I said earlier, we're, we're a very international church, so I'm hoping we'll talk to each other. I'm hoping that this is something that we'll build, we'll be able to build each other up with, that we'll all be able to, um, as Paul says in, in, in Ephesians 3 in his prayer, you know, he says, I want to read it to make sure I get it right, um, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And so that's my prayer for us. I'm hoping that we will come to see and appreciate the fullness of God just a little bit more, that we'll understand just a little bit more just the great lengths that God has gone to to save us and just how God meets all of our varied needs. And so I'm going to end there. We're going to pray. Um, we're going to sing some more songs. Um, during this next song, just as you're ready, you can come and take the elements of communion, um, take them back to your seat. Um, and then I'm, I'll come up and I'll lead us in, in the taking of the elements. Um, if you are in here um, and you're not a believer, if you have not understood your need for Jesus, then it wouldn't be appropriate for you to participate um, in this. This is something that, this is an act, again, an act of worship, but also a declaration for the believer in which we proclaim the death of Christ on our behalf. And this is something we do um, solemnly. This is something we do um, in remembrance, in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. And in so doing, we're saying that, yes, I, I, I'm guilty. I'm dishonored. I'm in fear. And I need I need Jesus. And so if you're not a believer in here, if you've not come to understand your need for Jesus, if you've not repented of your sins and turned, uh, turned to Jesus, um, then don't feel bad about sitting this one out. Um, no one's keeping track of who's taken and who isn't. Um, but rather, I would just encourage you to reflect on what's been said and, and consider the words of the song and feel free to come talk to me afterwards. So I'm going to pray for us um, and we'll start singing. Heavenly Father, God, I pray, God, help us to rightly understand you. Help us to rightly understand your gospel. 
God, we praise you for just, God, you do so much more than we could ever comprehend or even imagine. God, thank you that you loved the world so much that you sent Jesus, that you sent your only begotten son to die for us. And God, I thank you that your gospel is not relegated to one nation or culture. But God, your plan from the beginning has always been, has always been that people from every tribe, tongue, and nation would praise you and would be brought into your family. The Apostle John says that he writes these things and that, well, he says we write these things, we the apostles, that we Christians might have fellowship with you, God. God, you've always valued relationship over ritual. And so, God, I pray that that would be our heart's desire. For everyone in this room, God, I pray that we would desire relationship and not ritual with you. And God, I pray that just amongst the people of our church, God, I pray that just, God, that we would truly be a family. And God, you've blessed us with so many people from so many different countries and backgrounds and places. And yeah, God, it's just, it's incredible to see the diversity of your kingdom and just the various gifts and strengths and yeah, that the Holy Spirit has empowered us with to build one another up. And so God, we praise you and we thank you. Jesus, thank you that you died for us. Thank you that you were willing to come lay down your life for us. In Jesus' name, amen.